right, everybody. Thank, thank you for joining us this morning. I would like to call this meeting to order at 9 a.m. Thank you for joining us during our weekly virtual MLS breakfast meeting. My name is Giuseppe Veneziano of IREN Veneziano Realty. A few housekeeping rules here. Uh, all participants will be muted uh, upon entry to the MLS breakfast meeting. And should you have any questions or comments, please remember to enter it in the chat box. Please remember to join us weekly as we have our virtual MLS breakfast meeting every Thursday at 9 a.m. As always, this meeting is being recorded and will be available online on your YouTube channel, West San Gabriel Valley Realtors. Please remember to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also watch us uh, pre-recorded on YouTube. Uh, WSGVR also has a new text message service. Please text WSGVR to the number 72727. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Veneziano, as I mentioned, and uh, I am the December MLS program chair. And today's agenda consists of our affiliate spotlight, Carlos Rodriguez from Lewis Management Corp, followed by the president's message, Mindy Gay, WSGVR's president and our guest speaker, Liza Negrete, which is the vice pres uh, president of political affairs at CAR. Just a reminder that all to be eligible for today's raffle, you must be a WSGVR member and your name must be displayed to win. Uh, no telephone numbers will be accepted. So today's affiliate spotlight will be brought to you by our affiliate committee. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for having me as an affiliate spotlight today. This is the first time I think I've formally met anybody or any of the different MLS groups. Um, I am the business development manager over at home at, uh, at Lewis Management. It was, the position was most recently filled by uh, Marisa Capadillo, um, who's been very helpful in, in helping me transition into the new role and formerly held by Bob Carrots, the late great Bob Carrots that uh, many people knew. Um, a little bit about me right there on the affiliate spotlight. I've uh, got two kids, been married for over 25 years. Um, we'll be empty nesters soon. Um, I did come from a real estate background in the past and I've been with Lewis Management for over 10 years now. I'm looking forward to um, working on this side of things and reconnecting with the broker community and what that means. Um, looking forward to being a um, active affiliate member with your group. Um, and I would appreciate uh, reconnecting with some of you and letting me know what it is I can do to also help. Um, one of the things I wanna let people know is that uh, we have a lot of planned communities that we're developing right now regarding the um, the amount of lack of housing that's out there. We've almost sold twice as many homes as the, the companies that sell real estate have sold twice as many homes. Obviously we don't sell them, but we're doing twice as much as last year. And we've got some interesting things that are going on right here displayed are all the different uh, planned communities that we have currently. Um, also too, just to give you a little bit of tidbit, uh, starting next year, we've got Companies such as Pulte, TriPoint, Richmond American, Lennar, KB Century, Taylor Morrison, all have starts in the Chino Valley. This is something that um, is being worked on right now. And we're looking at things starting to be available of next year in June, July. Um, this is a, a little bit of a tidbit that people don't know. A uh, little insider information for all of you here. Um, I also ask everybody if you want to reach out, or you can also go look at lewisbroker.com to find out more about what it is I'm doing and how I can help um, the affiliates and um, the realtors and the broker community out there. Um, I would really like to connect with you and have more conversation about what it is what I do. And also uh, teach me what I can do to support you. This is obviously a new role for me. So I would like some guidance in what I, how, what I can do to maximize uh, my contribution to the West San Gabriel Valley Realtors. Awesome, thank you, Carlos, I really appreciate that. We uh, now have our top affiliates introduced for today. Please remember to support our affiliates with your transactions. Nancy Chan, lawyer's title. Uh, doesn't look like she's here. 
Okay. Mark Wu, Allstate Insurance. Unmute Mark. Yeah, he's here. Yeah, try to unmute. Nancy's here too. Oh, oh she is? Yeah. Okay. yeah. She Good morning, everybody. Side. This is Mark Wu with Allstate Insurance, 33 years servicing the San Gabriel Valley. We speak five languages out of our office. My licensed staff can help you out. Have a fabulous Christmas season. Nancy's Thank here. you, Mark. Let's go back to Nancy. Okay, good morning. I couldn't unmute myself. So good morning, everybody. Holiday season is coming. I just want to extend my sincere thankfulness for, for being in the association for 30 somewhat years and everybody's done so well and we're continue improving uh, with all the leadership that I really enjoy the music and the dancing. Ling, what, how come you didn't dance? So thank you so much. <laughs> you did? Okay. Uh, I didn't see it. I don't know why, but thank you so much. You can stand lawyer's title. I love to you and your family. Have a wonderful holiday season. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Vincent, Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, John. Sorry about that. John Wax. Yeah, step <laughs> Hello everyone, John Wax with SNAP NHD Natural Hazard Disclosures. I'm here for all your NHD tax needs. This is time to be thankful and grateful and I'm grateful and thankful to be working with all of you. I will be working throughout the holidays and um, call me. I bring 26 years of experience. I'm consultant and I'm here to help you with all your needs. Thank you so much and have a wonderful holiday season. All right, next on the agenda, Sandy Franco for First American Home Warranty. Good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday. Sandy Franco, First American Home Warranty. I'm here to be your home warranty expert. Call, text, or email me. I'm here to help. Have a great day. All right. Amy Adini from uh, Amy Adini Environmental Services. Oh, hello and good morning, everybody. Uh, phase one and phase two, environmental site assessments. Happy holiday and be happy. I know that you are happy, so just <laughs> continue to be happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Sage Gomez from my NHD. Good morning, everyone. Sage Gomez here with my NHD. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving and everyone has an even better Christmas. Stay safe out there. All right, Cosmo Sanchez from New Aim Funding. All right, thank you guys. Good morning. Um, hope you had a great holiday, a great Thanksgiving. I'm Cosmo Sanchez with New Aim Funding. Thank you. Uh, Cosmo, you got a little facial hair there, huh, buddy? Uh, Tom Zhang from TJ Management, LLC. Good morning, everybody. This is Tom Zhang from TJ Management. We specialize in one to four residential unit uh, management. And if you or your clients have any investment property that want to reduce your headache, uh, we'll come to refer them our way and we refer them back when the clients decide to buy or sell. Have a good day. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, affiliates. Now we're... Uh, here to uh, happy to include open pitching to our virtual MLS breakfast meeting. Today we have a listing from Agnes Ma from Century 2021 Citrus Realty. Hi. Good. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Good morning. I'm Agnes Ma. Hi, nice. Okay, so this listing is um, 111 Margarita Place, number 215 in Monterey Park. It's a senior home, meaning the residents one, the resident has to be 62 years older and older however the buyer need not be a senior just one resident of the of the home it's located in evergreen manor one and parking is available with qualifications it's at monterey park and it's close to many amenities um suitable for seniors um, um mainly groceries restaurants Banks, church, freeway, and it's a, it's a good time for an opportunity for, for someone in your family or your holidays. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Agnes. 
Um, President's message. Thank you. We, we have a quick tip, um, Giuseppe. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so quick tip, uh, don't ignore the compliance emails. Uh, a violation of the CRMLS rules must be corrected within two business days. Remember that, otherwise uh, you'll also trigger a uh, violation. Do not trigger a warning message and result in an automatic violation if you don't. Uh, failure to timely correct a violation, uh, you will get a citation, which means that you will be paying some money. Uh, CRMLS will utilize the email address provided by the participant as a contained with the MLS platform. It's very important to maintain a current email address. So if you don't have your uh, e access to your email address that's on file, please make sure you go online to crmls.org and um, also uh, make sure that your email is current. Uh, the system auto expire and auto sale is a violation. So make sure that after your transaction, you go in there and you make sure that you uh, close that transaction. So again, there's the email address right down there in red. Uh, first Thursday, uh, every first Thursday of every month, the WSGVR MLS breakfast. So every first Thursday of every month, the WSGVR MLS breakfast meeting will include a helpful tip and or reminder to help the realtor navigate the real estate platform service and the industry. Thank okay, we lost Giuseppe. Okay, the next one will be our uh, Mindy Ye, our president message. Mindy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Elaine. Good morning and happy holidays, WSUVR family and friends. I'm Mindy. It's such an honor to be your president. Thank you for attending our weekly virtual MLS breakfast meetings. And we're always grateful for your continued support as a valuable member of West San Diego Valley Realtors. Please don't hesitate to reach out to our leadership team and staff who are always here for you, especially during this wild and difficult time. Wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season. And with that, I would like to share this with you. It's not how much we give, but how much love we put into giving by Mother Teresa. The best of all gifts around any Christmas tree, the present of a happy family all wrapped up in each other by Burton, Burton Hills. On November 24, the California Association of Realtor, Realtors applauds Federal Housing Financing Agency FHFA for raising Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac conforming loan limits for 2021. So the FHFA announces the increase on the conforming loan limits for mortgages applying by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to 548,250 on a one unit property and a cap of 822,375 in higher cost areas. So the previous loan limits were 510, 400, and, and up to 765,600 respectively. California uh, CAR issues a statement, I'm sorry, uh, CAR National Association of Realtors, NAR both have long advocated for making higher conforming loan limits Permanently, as a result of CAR and NAR efforts, cities with high medium home prices have benefited from the loan limits above the national conforming loan limits. That's all the update I have this morning. I would like to thank our special guest speaker today, Lisa Nagreta. Please also join us next Thursday, December 10, our very first virtual installation and awards ceremony. Additional information will be available by the end of this weekend or latest Monday. Thank you, uh, Giuseppe, who's back. Pauline, oh, take it away. All right, so, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Liza Negrete, Vice President of Political Affairs from California Association of Realtors, who will be giving us some updates today. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to meet you. If we haven't had a chance to meet, as I, uh, they mentioned, I work for the California Association of Realtors, and I work with the political action committees of CAR, uh, which is a group of volunteer realtors uh, from throughout the state that make decisions on uh, which candidates to support. And we also run campaigns. So we also ran a Proposition 19 campaign. So today I will be giving you a post-election report and uh, please feel free to ask any questions and hopefully you will enjoy it. Lynn, let her you share. Wanna share? Yes, Lynn, let her share the screen, please. All right, and can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Okay, so as I mentioned to you, uh, I'm gonna be giving you a post-election report. You know, I uh, will give a lot of political commentary. It's not meant to offend anyone. Uh, you know, on either side of the aisle, it really is just observations of what happened this election cycle, and that's what it's meant to be. Uh, so um, hopefully uh, I don't offend you with my comments. Uh, so one thing to know about, you know, uh, elections is that the presidential elections in California tend to draw a higher number of voters. Um, there are people that don't vote unless there's a president on the ballot. And the rest of the time, they really don't pay attention. So in the lead up to this election, there was a lot of questions of, you know, are people gonna come out and vote? There's a lot of uh, civil unrest, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement's going on. Uh, you have a lot of uh, passionate feelings, you know, uh, about uh, President Trump, whether people like him or don't like him. There's really a lot of attention that has been given to politics. And so there was a lot of speculation about how many people would come out to vote. And a lot of folks were predicting that it was going to be a historic year uh, compared to that of the 1960s. If you look at this chart, in the 1960s, California experienced some of the highest voter turnout in the state, which was in the uh, mid to high 80s. And that's what we were expecting. Now, uh, from a political perspective in California, when more voters come out and vote, it usually favors Democrat candidates. So based on that speculation, you know, a, a very blue state that California is, was expected to become much bluer. As you all know, we have double super majorities in the assembly and the Senate uh, and uh, Democrats pretty much control the state. So there was a lot of questions of how much bluer can a blue state get? Uh, but the story of what actually happened is very interesting. Uh, you can see here that uh, in the last uh, presidential election 2016, the voter turnout was a little bit below average, uh, 75, uh, a little bit over 75 percent. And let me show you what the most recent election uh, looked like. Oh, excuse me. I'm trying to maneuver. So you can see that in 2008 presidential election, this was when Obama got elected, uh, less than the average number of people came out to vote. So despite all of the attention given to President Obama and the historic nature of that election, um, less than, you know, 77% uh, of the people voted. Uh, so it means it wasn't even an average election year. In 2016, uh, when President Trump was on the ballot, uh, the turnout was slightly higher, but again, it didn't reach uh, the average turnout in California. A lot of uh, the thought behind that is, you know, people, in California seem to know where the election is going, so they might not necessarily vote. Um, this presidential election, uh, there were more voters. It's about 80% turnout, yet um, it still, you know, wasn't as historic as people expected it. One thing to note, though, is that nationwide, there was a historic turnout uh, of folks, um, but not so much in California. Um, but, you know, Realtors statewide should be very happy. The board of directors opposed the split role initiative and that failed. Proposition 19 was sponsored by uh, CAR and that passed. And then we opposed rent control and that also failed. Um, this presentation isn't necessarily going to focus on Prop 19, uh, but you should know that we do have a legal... Oh, it looks like we're having a little technical difficulties. Liza? Are you back? As I mentioned, the Democrats control California. We have a supermajority in the assembly, which started in the 27th. What does that mean? It means that uh, Democrats don't necessarily need to work with Republicans 
to pass things uh, you know that require uh, allocating funds of the state and you can see that uh, you know currently we're at 61 Democrats and 19 Republicans and so again we call this a supermajority and based on the election results they pretty much stayed the same there were a couple of uh, assembly members who switched parties. Uh, Brian Mainshine from San Diego, a former Republican, became a Democrat. So the Republicans lost a member uh, when that shift happened. Uh, assembly member Chad Mays went from Republican to no political party preference candidate, and you see that represented here. Uh, so there uh, is a lot of shift away from the Republican Party when you look at uh, the state uh, legislative numbers. Um, so I'm going to show you the faces of some of the folks uh, in the legislature, this is um, information of, uh, throughout the state, uh, and it'll just give you a perspective of, you know, who's new and, and what they do. Uh, you know, Assembly District 13, safe Democratic seat, look at the registration there, over 48% of the folks are Democrat. Carlos Villapadua uh, will, is a new face of the California legislature. We do expect him to be a business-friendly elected official. Assembly District 25, Alex Lee, also a safe Democratic district. Look at the registration there, over 48% Democrats registered. Alex Lee will be the youngest assembly member elected in the history of uh, the legislature. We don't expect him to be very friendly to our industry. In fact, he met with us, asked for our support, CREPAC responded and cut him a check. And then he refused to take it, saying he had made a pledge to tenant groups that he wouldn't take our money. So we don't expect that he will be friendly to our industry. Assembly District 33, uh, this is a, uh, you can look at the registration there, slightly favors Republicans. Uh, and here we supported uh, Thurston Smith. We expect that he will be supportive of our industry. But then again, if you look, think of the numbers of the assembly, Republicans, um, really have to work across the aisle to be able to be effective in the legislature. Otherwise, the Democrats will just leave them behind and not, uh, not include them in anything. Uh, and so that means that if there's a Republican who just wants to be uh, staunch and, and passionate about their values and, and you know, let's say President Trump and, and what he stands for, that's fine. Uh, but he, he or she will not be an effective member that will be able to pass policies because Republicans really need to build relationships in order to get anything passed. Otherwise, anything that a Republican carries in the legislature is doomed to fail. Assembly District 35, Jordan Cunningham. This was a highly watched seat. We help support the incumbent. Look at the registration here. It slightly favors a Democrat, but the registration is very close uh, for that reason. Uh, Democrats spent a lot of money here trying to take out incumbent Jordan Cunningham. Uh, we supported his candidacy and he was successful. And Jordan Cunningham is an example of a Republican who really works across the aisle, is business friendly and can be effective despite the supermajority environment. Okay, Assembly District 36, Tom Lackey, look at the registration here. 40% plus Democrat, 29% Republican, yet Tom Lackey was able to hold on to this seat. Uh, and we were helpful as well um, in being able to help them. So one thing I want you to notice is, you know, this is supposed to be a presidential election year that favors Democrats. A lot of Republicans that were targeted by the Democratic Party and had a lot of resources spent against them were able to hold on to their seats. So in the bluest state in the nation, Republicans won. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting story to tell, considering that we did have a Democrat president win nationwide. And again, that we're one of the bluest states. Uh, Assembly District 37, Steve Bennett. This is a very safe Democratic district. He will be a new face there. Assembly District 38 is another interesting story. Uh, this district was formerly represented by a Democrat. And um, at the end of it, a Republican ended up rep uh, representing this district. And another thing I wanna point out is when you see the candidates that won on the Republican side this year, a lot of them represent the communities they serve. Here, Suset Martinez, um, you know, uh, Latina Republican, you had um, in the congressional races, which I will talk further, 
also candidates that represent the communities of, of the districts there. And so Republicans were able to win with minority candidates, which is also a story not often told on the Republican side and is often more highlighted um, on the Democratic side. Okay, Assembly District 42, Chad Mays. This is the former Republican I mentioned turned no party preference. Uh, and uh, he's highly uh, being uh, recruited by the Democratic Party, so there's thought that he might actually switch. Look at the registration here, it slightly favors a Democrat, and he was able to win the seat by being able to get Democrat as well as keep some of his Republican base of support. Assembly District 55, Philip Chen, one of the most highly targeted seats. You can see here why. Look at the registration, slightly favors a Democrat. Again, uh, this Republican was able to hold on to his seat. Assembly District 57, uh, the, the very safe Democratic seat, Lisa Calderon. What you should know about Lisa Calderon is she's part of a uh, very well-known political family dynasty in California politics. Uh, her husband is former assembly member, Chuck Calderon. Most recently, her stepson, Ian Calderon, represents, uh, represented this district and now uh, she's representing this district. The interesting thing about this race was also that uh, it was a battle between two political families, uh, the uh, Rubio sisters, as uh, they are known, also ran uh, for this seat. Uh, Blanca Rubio and Susan Rubio won each in the Assembly and Senate, ran a campaign for their sister against Lisa Calderon, which was unsuccessful. Okay, uh, Assembly District 59, Reggie Jones Sawyer. He is in the most Democratic district in the state. Look at the registration there, 64.8% Democrat. He really pissed off uh, the Correctional Peace Officers Association, so much so that they spent about a million dollars trying to get him out of the seat. And let me show you why. Look at the ethnic population there, 75% plus Latino. And there was a Latino candidate going against him and that's where they put the resources, but they were unsuccessful and Reggie Jones Sawyer was able to keep his seat. Uh, CAR was helpful to him in that effort. Assembly District 67, Kelly Sayardo, uh, retired firefighter, uh, Republican. We believe that he will uh, see eye to eye with us on many issues. And again, he just has to, if he wants to be effective, build relationships across the aisle. Assembly District 68, Stephen Choi. Look at the registration here, almost even Democrat, Republican. This was a seat predicted to uh, be flipped this cycle and that didn't happen. Again, you know, the story here overall is that despite how blue California is and the fact that more people came out to vote than other presidential years, if 16 and 18, Republicans were able to hold on. So there's a story to tell there that you know, there might have been folks who voted for Biden, but then when they looked down ticket and uh, they voted for assembly and Senate candidates, they might have voted across party aisles. Assembly District 72, Janet Wynn. Uh, this is a district that uh, slightly favors Republicans. Democrats spend a lot of money, uh, but Repu Republicans were able to keep this seat. Uh, this is a, a seat that's safe Republican, and this is just a new face of the assembly. Assembly District 74, this has been a seat that has uh, been played a uh, tug of war between Democrats and Republicans, uh, but the Democrats were able to hold on to this seat. Same with this, there was a tug of war, Democrats were able to hold on to this seat. And then this is Brian Mainshine, the Republican who turned Democrat. He was targeted by uh, the Republican Party, but he was able to hold on to his seat as now a Democrat candidate. And finally, a new face of the Democratic uh, Party on the Assembly side, Chris Ward. Okay, on the Senate side, uh, also a similar story in 2017, 2018, Democrats reached a supermajority. And look at that in 2019, 29 blues and 11 reds and let me show you what happened so here the democrats were actually able to pick up two additional seats so while in the assembly the makeup of the democrats and republicans stayed the same in the senate two additional democrats uh, won seats here 
Um, Susan, uh, Senate District 5, Susan Eggman came from the assembly, terrible for real estate, is in the Senate. We don't expect much from her. We did try to take her out uh, by running a negative campaign against her and it didn't work. She was very strong um, in that district. Senate District 7, Steve Glazier, known as a business friendly Democrat, he was being attacked by um, um, the most progressive wing of the Democratic Party because they don't like his middle of the road stances and he was able to keep his seat with our help as well. Uh, one of our strongest moderates and housing champions is Scott Weiner. He really leads in the legislature with uh, uh, proposals that push for building more housing. Uh, he is uh, one of the folks that we work closely with on housing solutions. He was being attacked by uh, the left uh, because they consider him to be uh, too much of a moderate and we also helped keep this seat for him. Senate District 13, Josh Becker, safe democratic seat, new face of the Senate. Senate District 15, Dave Cortezzi, <coughs> also a new face of the Senate. He has a real estate background. His whole family is in real estate. He's also a, a property investor, owns rental units. So we think that he will be pragmatic in our issues and will be uh, responsive uh, to our uh, requests. Senate District 17, John Laird, new face. He didn't really have a race, no opposition. So he made it through very easily. Senate District 19, former assemblywoman, ran for Senate unopposed, also had an easy win. Senate District 21, one of the most highly targeted seats. Look at the registration there, favors Democrats with a plus eight uh, registration advantage and look how much he uh, won by 50.8% of the vote. And uh, again, the story goes, a lot of Republicans won in California, uh, which is just amazing considering how blue the state is. Senate District 23, we are very proud of this win. We supported uh, Rosalicio Chobok's candidacy. She is a realtor and she had a very tough battle, was highly uh, funded by the Democratic side. And the registration here does favor Democrats, uh, but she was able to make it through. Again, goes along with the story that a lot of Republicans won in California, despite uh, the state and nationwide results that uh, benefited Democrats. Okay, Senate District 29, this was a pickup seat for the Democrats. Uh, Ling Ling uh, Chang previously held this seat. So this is one of the ones that Democrats were able to pick up. You could see there that Democrats have a uh, plus seven uh, registration advantage. Senate District 37, uh, Dave Min, this is another uh, seat that the Democrats were able to pick up. And here, uh, former Senator John Morlack held this seat previously. And so he will be a new face. Uh, his background is in economics. He's an Ivy Leaguer. And I know that he agrees with us on a lot of our federal issues. Uh, I am not certain uh, that he will be that friendly on our state issues. Okay. On the congressional seats, look at this. Republicans picked up four seats in a presidential election. Uh, again, Republicans won a lot. Um, you know, nationwide, um, there's also a lot of dis uh, discussion about whether people like Trump or don't like Trump. And yes, Trump lost, but he also lost uh, by getting a significant uh, number of votes this time around compared to the first time that he got elected. So uh, from my perspective, Democrats should be looking at what happened in California and nationwide and questioning what they are doing wrong, that they are losing support for their base. And I'm gonna show you some of the messages that were used. So um, here's sort of a summary of what happened with the congressional elections. Republicans flipped four of the seven seats Democrats took in 2018. That included uh, Valadeo, Young Kim, Mike Garcia, and Michelle Steele. Um, and three of these candidates made history because they're the first Republicans since 1994. This is nationwide to unseat a sitting Democratic House member. Again, this happened in California, the bluest district. Um, and uh, the RNC, uh, excuse me, NRC or the National Republican uh, Committee uh, chair mentioned, you know, shows the importance of recruitment and finding candidates that reflect the constituency. Uh, a record number of Republican women got elected. Uh, and that's also 
something that made history. You usually also hear that um, when the Democrats do it, but less so when Republicans do it. And Republicans are making history this time around with how many women uh, they have elected. Messages used against Democrats were, um, you know, cutting taxes and uh, keeping small businesses open during the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, Republicans call Democrats police defunding socialists. And it looked like, you know, in a lot of these races, that message resonated with the voters. Okay, um, so here are some of the faces. Jay Obernolte, uh, former assembly member, won his election for Congress. Uh, Jim Costa was able to hold on to his seat, uh, safe democratic seat. Uh, David Valadeo had lost his seat, so he had been the incumbent of this seat uh, and was able to pick it back up again. So this was one of the pickups by the Republicans. Uh, Mike Garcia and Christy Smith had a very uh, tight battle. Look at the uh, final uh, percentage of votes. He got 50% of the vote. He won by about 300 votes compared to the Democrat opponent here. So this was one of the, it actually was the closest race in the state. Okay, again, Young Kim, look at that margin of victory. You're gonna see them very close. Um, and that means, you know, when you see a margin of victory that's very slim, it really uh, comes down to which candidate worked the hardest to reach out more voters. And here we're seeing that Republicans did that in all of these races. Okay, a Congressional District 45, Katie Porter. Uh, this registration favors a Republican. We keep an eye on her because CAR was a big part in getting her elected into the seat. Okay, Congressional District 48, Michelle Steele, another pickup for the Republicans here. Again, look at the margin of victory. They're very slight. Okay, Congressional District 49, Mike Levin, targeted seat. He was able to hold on to his seat. Uh, Daryl Issa, this was also a very close race, but at the end, um, Daryl Issa was able to hold on. You could see that the registration here uh, for Republicans uh, is slightly favored compared to Democrats. And then a new face for uh, Congress, Sarah Jacobs. She is part of the Qualcomm family in San Diego. Uh, so she's very well connected. And I believe uh, she served in the Obama administration. So that's just a new face. Um, I also want to share with you uh, very briefly a program we have. It's called Operation Growth. I know that there's a lot of um, members, uh, you know, and understandably so. You all work and meet a lot of these people running for office. You see them at the grocery store. You, you know, you know them uh, in a sense closer than we might at the state level, and uh, are very. And, and you all always mention that you're very nervous about negative campaigning, but negative campaigning works. And uh, we started a new program that allows local associations to run negative campaigns against local candidates. Uh, as a last resort, you know, once you've tried to build a relationship, uh, you've you've tried to build a connection, and it it doesn't happen. And you know, there are some candidates that really just work against our issues. That's what this program is for. And uh, we ran uh, uh, these races, and you can see here that out of all the ones we ran, we lost two of them, and they were very effective. So I'm going to just run through these very quickly. Uh, so an incumbent, Denise Barnes, uh, we ran a negative campaign against her and we took her out. Here are some of the mailers that, you know, we sent out against her. Uh, Berkeley City Council District, uh, incumbent Cheryl Davila, very uh, antagonistic against our industry. We ran a negative campaign against her. We took her out. Here are some of the campaigns against her. You know, she was absent a lot. Um, she she was absent a lot, but one of the things she did do is she showed up to vote to get a pay raise. So those are the types of things we highlight for folks. Oak Grove Mayor, this was a big deal. Maybe it seems like a big deal to me because this is where, you know, the area I live in, but we took out a mayor. Uh, and so, um, you know, negative campaigning works. Uh, Sacramento City Council District 8, this is one of our losses, but um, the race was so close that you know um it was within a hundred uh a couple hundred votes and so it was still worth doing and this was a battle between sort of establishment uh labor 
and business community and we were supporting Les Simmons, but uh, Mai Vang did end up being victorious. Uh, San Jose uh, City Council District 4, we also lost this race, uh, but again, a battle worth having. Uh, here are some of the messages we used. Uh, San Jose race, another one, but we won this one. Here are some of the messages used. And that's all I have for you. I love politics. I hope you can tell. If this is your jam and you like this kind of stuff, I encourage you to apply to the political action committees for CAR. The uh, applications open up in the beginning of the year and we talk politics all year long. At the local level, you have a committee that does this as well. It's called the LCRC committee or the local candidate recommendation committee. They make all the decisions for local candidates, which means that you know that's the group that would decide whether a negative campaign would be run and who to support. And so, uh, like I said, if this is your interest, I hope um, to see you one day in either LCRC or in any of the PAC committees. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I will also post the Prop 19 legal uh, Q&A link on the chat now. All right, um, Eliza, that was a very, very informative information. Um, that just shows that there's a lot of uh, important races in our state and local um, local in, uh, politicians that are, are running for office that we need to keep informed on the candidates and make sure that we are voting in the right people that um, will do good for the incumbent or not the incumbent, their constituents, excuse me. Uh, we have one question that I see um, for Prop 19. Um, does it, does Prop 19 abolish Prop 58, 60 and 90? Prop, yes, yeah. Uh, so Prop 60 and 90 are actually expanded statewide by Proposition 19. So it strengthens the ability to use Prop 60. Um, 90 basically allows counties to accept people from other counties into their county. Um, but we're basically saying now you can go statewide. So the counties don't have the option to opt in to accept a tax base now every county is required to accept uh, the tax base so that's that proposition 58 uh, which was passed by the voters um, I, I believe it was a 70s 80s um, that allowed uh, folks to pass on their primary family residence to their kids and in essence also um, as an heir inherit the tax bases that came with that property regardless of how many properties you inherited, regardless of um, the price of the properties. Uh, and the reason why the voters passed it really was because the argument that was made is that people who inherited the family homes, they wanted to be able to keep it, whether for sentimental value or for investment purposes. But the, the argument really was people want to keep the family home because there's a strong connection to it. What Prop 19 does, it says, we get it. There's a strong connection to the family property. If you live in it, you can keep the uh, property tax basis. If you are using the property for investment purposes or you don't live in it, then it's going to uh, be reassessed for market value. And so that means that if you're inheriting more than one property, you can only inherit the tax basis for the one property you choose to live in. So it doesn't repeal Prop 58. It limits it uh, to only folks that use it as a primary residence. Okay, that's interesting. And when does uh, Prop 19 take effect? Uh, the two major provisions are the tax portability and the intergenerational transfer. The intergenerational transfer goes into effect February 16th and the uh, Tax portability, April 1st. April 1st. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions. I see something in the chat. I see something came in and says, uh, please elaborate if CAR funds and assist realtors who have an interest in running for political office. And yes. if so, how, how, what's the process to apply? Thank you for your question. We love, love, love when realtors run for office because whether you know it or not, everything you do as a realtor is the exact same thing you would do to run for office. 
Uh, you have to get out there in the community, get to know people, establish your reputation, and you know they have to remember who you are. And at the end of the day, you have to have enough trust of people for them to uh, trust you with one of the biggest choices in their life. As a candidate, uh, it translates to contributions and writing checks. Uh, so CAR does have candidate training programs where we teach you how to run for office. And um, we have those for local candidates. And then we have a more advanced program for state candidates. Uh, we, so we provide you resources and tools to help you. But once you become a candidate, um, then we, ha we have to back off for legal reasons. We can't you know, fully fund your campaign. Uh, there are things that we can do. For example, in the case of the senator that won, Rosalicio Ochoa Bogue, uh, who's a realtor, we help support her through an independent expenditure. But even if you were to run, uh, we could not have a conversation with you about that type of support because it is illegal for organizations to uh, work with candidates to conduct independent expenditures. Uh, and that's the rule, you can't collaborate. Um, and so we can help you if you're interested, uh, please uh, not contact right now. me. Okay, uh, actually, let's see, there's one more question that I can see here. Um, if, prop, if property buyers already took advantage of Prop 90, can they take advantage of Prop 19 in the future? So the uh, Proposition 19 allows people to carry their tax portability three times. And so uh, that's one of the things that's being worked out right now, meaning do people start over? or uh, does the transfer they've already had add on to the three? So that's something in the legislation that has to be worked out. But if they already did it once, of course they have two additional times to uh, carry their tax portability anywhere in the state, regardless of the price of the home. So under Prop 60, it had to be a home of equal or lesser value. Prop 19 actually allows you to carry your tax uh, base to a home of greater value. Awesome. Well, that was our last question that we have time for. And so I'd like to thank you, Liza, for uh, on behalf of the West San Gabriel Valley Realtors for all that wonderful information so we can actually soak it all up. And um, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. All right. Next on the agenda, we have attendance drawing. Please type your DRE member name and email in the chat box um, and make sure uh, only participants with their names can participate and uh, no telephone numbers. There we go. All right, Carlos Rosas, are you here still? No, he's not here. Next. Tom Berge Jr. Are you here? Tom. I mute Tom. Yes, he is here. Congratulations, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thomas Wong, Thomas. Wow, we got a lot of Toms in the winning today. Thomas, congratulations. Thank you, UCP. All right. Next winner. Tom, no, I'm just joking. Sage Gomez. All right, Sage, are you still here, Sage? Yes, you are. I am here. Congratulations. Thank you. That's all the attendance uh, signs for this week. So please make sure to participate in our education classes. 
Uh, a list of upcoming classes will be displayed on our screen, as you can see here. Thank you everyone for joining our meeting this morning. Uh, please join us next week when we'll be having our virtual installation and awards ceremony. That's going to be fun. Uh, we uh, encourage you to attend. And don't forget, please support our affiliates with your transactions. And our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>